think of somebody today or tomorrow that uh, you can encourage or you can say something yes. nice for or even do something nice for without them even knowing it. Absolutely. You know, that makes you feel good, too. Welcome to the Meyer Clinics podcast. Join our licensed clinical professionals from various backgrounds as they discuss fascinating mental health topics with a wide range of guests. Meyer Clinics is a Christian counseling organization with multiple clinics nationwide dedicated to treating the whole person emotionally, physically, and spiritually. Welcome to our listening family. We thank you for joining us. Hello, listeners. Guess who is back on the podcast? Dr. Paul Meyer. It has been several months. Hi, Paul. Ah, uh, yeah. We took a a break for various, uh, you know, vacations and uh, other things that were going on. And uh, so I'm glad we're doing this again. I I missed uh, I missed being with you to do these, and uh, so it's been a few months. Yeah, absolutely. It's not like there hasn't been a lot going on <laughs> in the world. Yeah. <laughs> but today uh, we're going to talk about coercive control. And I want to give um, one definition that I Googled. It says coercive control is an act or a pattern of acts of assault, threats, humiliation, and intimidation, or other abuse that is used to harm, punish, or frighten their victim. And there's, there's many different types um, of coercive control, but um, 60 to 80% of women seeking abuse, seeking assistance for abuse have experienced coercive control. It's, so it, it is often grounded in gender-based privilege. Um, but Paul, you're going to get into, well, we both will get into, you know, there, there are many types that this applies to. Probably the most commonly known is in a domestic violence situation. Yeah, I was surprised. We hear about the, uh, it, you know, it, men are bigger than women and more violent and things. And so we hear uh, it makes it sound like it's uh, like 90% to 10%. But um, in a 2015 national uh, survey, 36.6 million women and 33.1 million in the United States had experienced some form of course of control by it an intimate partner during their lifetime. So, it, you know, it, it, there's a lot of men that get, uh, that um, will experience course of control by their wives too, but it's not. Right. I, I don't think it's that. I think 36 to 31, I think somebody must have twisted it a little somewhere. You know, cause I'm, I'm sure it must be at least, you know, seven out of 10 that are the women getting abused. Yeah, and you have to think about things to situations where, you know, where there are other mitigating factors involved, like uh, someone who is trying to verbally and mentally control you, but they, and maybe they're not hitting you, they're not physically yeah. assaulting you. However, they are always wearing multiple weapons. There are yeah. always weapons around, you know, things like that, where you're on a, a witness stand uh, being asked by an attorney who's defending the person who is coercively controlling you. And you're asked, well, did he or she ever hit you? And the victim says, well, no. OK, well, case closed. And and then there's all these other factors. Well, did they charge at you? Did they use their body to. Uh, you know, in, because they're larger than you to make you feel afraid and always wearing a gun or knives or, you know, there's just so many ways that this kind of control can seep in where that question of did they ever hit you really is it, it's no longer the, the, thank goodness, the determining no, factor. All, mm -hmm. Right. There's all kinds of course of control, which we'll get into today. Now, if, if somebody is physically violent, um, and I don't mean just a one time minor incident, but if somebody's, if a mate is physically violent, the, uh, chances of being killed by that mate are 10%. So it's higher than you would think. Absolutely. And you have to look at things too, like, 
um, does this person drink and take heavy medication and also have these other situations, you know, have they been violent with someone in front of you, not necessarily you, but in front of, uh, you know, your kids or another relative, they didn't touch you, but they're doing this in front of you to let you know that, you know, you better not get out of line yeah. because the, I can even, do this to you too. You know, another thing is even a nice uh, guy who's a pro football player or something like that. And they, uh, or even in high school, they do that now. And they, they take uh, steroids to build up their muscles and be more aggressive. They mm-hmm. can get violent and, and, and beat up on their wives and stuff. And when they get off the steroids, they can't believe they did that, you know? So Right. Right. There are so many mitigating factors. So I, I'd love to get into some examples that people can go look at because it's, it's very difficult when you're speaking to someone who's been under someone else's control, mind control, psychological control, financial control. It's they're trained to um, make excuses. I've even heard them like list off a resume of how wonderful this person is that has been abusing them for years. This They're this person's cheerleader, and yet they are being actively abused for years um, like a trained dog to do whatever this person, you know, says. And if lawyers and family members and friends and pastors have a of it's all it's like this person is has been under the control of a cult leader and they have to be deprogrammed from this person's control which is coercive yeah. control and, and before we get into uh domestic violence type or domestic course of control there are other kinds too like um i made a trip to cuba for example years ago where uh, a group of doctors to get in there we it, we wanted to really help them and and you know it's an atheistic country so we wanted to tell them about God too and His love and and so a group of doctors donated a half million dollars worth of uh, medical equipment that they couldn't use for you know we wouldn't give them money to a country like that but medical equipment because they're real short on that so Castro let us go around and speak I I got to talk. Uh, uh, about Christian psychiatry and things like that to a thousand doctors in in uh, in uh, Havana and in a few hundred in Cienfuegos and and uh, we even got to be on uh, Cuban radio and, and I got to meet with uh, some of his uh, minister minister you know ministerial staff administrative staff and uh, um. He he had a spy follow me around that told me he was a spy to make sure I didn't say anything bad about Fidel. But in that right. country, I, I stayed at the home of the top uh, surgeon in the country, and he lived in a very poverty-stricken home. His child, uh, he made $40 a month, and uh, his child, for his toy, he had a you know one of those scooters that you put one foot on, but it only had one wheel. Mm. And... Uh, his wife had to get in line once a week um, to get a loaf of bread and um, I bought him a Coke to drink. Cause you know me, I've always got a Coke in my hand. I got one sitting here now. <laughs> and, uh, and he, I noticed he sipped on a little bit all day long instead of drinking it like I did. And, and, uh, and then and I said, how come you're sipping on that all day long? He said, well, you know, I can only afford to get one of these, but you know, maybe once every month or two and, and when he finished it, he wouldn't go take it out to the trash can because his neighbors would be jealous if they saw him carrying the can. And so he, he wrapped it in a little piece of paper or something and threw it in the trash can. And uh, and yet the leaders are, you know, multi-billionaires and stuff, but the people are living in poverty. And uh, they get supposed, oh, you hear, oh, well, they get you know, free medical care. Yeah, they get free medical care. And they don't. They don't have any anesthesia, you know, when they do right. surgery. And they, they'll take one guy's. If they need a crutch to walk out of the door, they'll take it from somebody that's already got one, laying in a bed, and hand it to them and stuff. And it's really a uh, horrible. Um, but and I'm not just bad mouthing Cuba. I'm saying uh, there's coercive control in in uh, uh, most communist type countries like North Korea. People are eating dirt and things like that. And and uh, 
Venezuela used to be one of the wealthiest countries, and now the people are uh, dying and starving and stuff. And so there's uh, there's a lot of rulers, even in the good in the countries that are democratic and stuff. There's there's rulers that uh, that use course of control sometimes hidden and sometimes just outwardly and blatant and uh and that's really narcissistic and sociopathic there's some people you and i were talking about the fact that there's some people that are nice that mean well that are just born uh with more obsessive compulsive tendencies that mm-hmm. that want to like i i got a friend who if we if a group of six of us go out to eat he he uh sort of shows us where to sit and he's not trying to be selfish He's just, you know, he thinks he's being nice, you know, and, uh, and, uh, like Monk, my wife and I were watching the TV show Monk last night and that's about a, it's an old TV so, series. So a lot of our listeners right now are listening to him. You may not have seen that show, but it's funny. You need to see it sometime. But a detective who's got severe OCD and, mm-hmm. uh, he sees a little girl ice skating and she, and she's only wearing one glove cause she lost one. And so he, he, he runs across the ice skating rink and accidentally knocks a couple of people down and gets to her. And, and takes your glove off and puts it in your pocket. He says, you can only wear, you can't wear one, one, uh, glove cause that's uneven. So you need to wear no gloves unless you find the one that's missing. And, uh, and she just looked at him and he, then he ran back off, but he, he meant, well, he, he just thought it would be really bad for her to only wear one glove, you know? And, and, uh, and so he meant well, but he was exerting some coercive control in a sense. I mean, you know, he didn't, you know, stay there and make sure she did it or anything. But, uh, and then, uh, my wife and I, I like John Wayne movies, you know, but my wife and I were watching one that was, you know, pretty old and the culture, even then, you know, those, when was that about 50 years ago or so, uh, the culture, even then or 45 years ago or so the culture, even then, um, John Wayne's a good guy in that movie. And yet he spanks his wife and it's considered a good thing. Right. And I was telling I was telling you, Kristen, that there's somebody that works here at at our clinic who, uh, when she went to she went to a real legalistic uh, college when she was young, uh, about you know 30 years ago, and they actually taught taught from when they were having a big uh, assembly, the, the the president of the college or some leader of the college even taught at the assembly that's okay for husbands to spank their wives if they disobey. Right. Um, my wife and I like to watch series, and, and we were trying to watch some hysterical series because she's got some ancestors that were actually kings and things like that. And so we were watching a series that, that went back to the 800 AD, and uh, and just the women were just used right and left. And we had to turn it off because even though it, it wasn't an R-rated even series, you know, but but it uh, it just the abuse was just uh, too much for her to handle. And uh, she got mad at me that it bothered her worse than it. It bothered me too, but she's suffered some, you know, in childhood and things. And so it bothered her worse than it bothered me, but it did bother me a lot. And, uh, but we had to quit watching because it was just too much to be. And, and so there's a lot of areas of, of a course of control that happened, including, politics and um, cultural uh, uh, women have been forcibly controlled for thousands of years. And, I, and I'm glad that they're finally breaking free now. And uh, uh, I guess they're breaking free to the extent that sometimes now, now men are getting <laughs> gay strength. And I don't know very many men did in the past. Okay. So that's my little spiel. To, <laughs> to, 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 before we get into the, the most common type, which is in relationships. Hi, this is Dr. Paul Meyer of the Meyer Clinics. Our Christian counselors across the country have a goal of helping all those who come to us to become what God has called them to be. If you're in a situation where you're not at peace within yourself or you just feel like there's joy that's missing in your life, we can come alongside to help you obtain peace and joy. This message is sponsored by the Meyer Clinic Foundation, a nonprofit Christian counseling ministry. The number is 1 888 7 Clinic, 1 888 7 C L I N I C.
Right. And, and yes, someone with OCD, um, you know, with, you know, some kind of mental illness, a disorder can fall under that as well. And those are things that, you know, behavior modification, uh, DBT, CBT, things like that, that you can work through in therapy when it, when it becomes a situation where it's abusive is, um, you know, it, that's a whole other level. And it's interesting where now and, and hard fought to get this to be um, made a crime, it, it is coercive control is a crime in the UK. It is not yet in the United States. It, it should be if, if it's provable, because people, a lot of people will accuse each other. People, people who use coercive control are the first to accuse the other, the mate of doing it, you know. <laughs> right. Sometimes. Right. I And I think what it would be good is if we give some examples in, in situations um, that you've seen and that I've seen where um, that's being used in a domestic violence situation. Oh, it's so sad, Kristen, when, when we get a... Um, we, I've seen a lot of clients over the years, not just in our day program where they come seven hours a day, five days a week for three weeks and open up it in outpatient therapy where they'll finally get to a point where they, that well, that where their mate is uh, running around on them all the time and then beating them up if they complain and, and, uh, and using different um, means to control them, like isolating one thing that, a, a narcissist or a sociopath will commonly do if uh, like, if you're starting, if, if you're a woman listening to us today uh, or a man who happens to be being, you know, dating somebody that's got those tendencies, one of the first things they do is isolate you from your support system. So they won't want you to visit your family. They'll, they'll say bad things about your family and they'll, uh, and about your friends and they'll pit you against people so that they have, uh, the lone influence on you. So that's one thing to watch for in your relationship is isolating you from your support. And another thing is when they start monitoring your activity throughout the day, usually the more somebody doesn't trust the mate, uh, the more likely that that person's the one that's doing what they don't trust the mate for. Right, um, exactly. And then denying you freedom and autonomy. Uh, gaslighting means... Uh, well, no, well, you do that more than I do, you know, manipulate, lie, uh, try to get the victim to think that he's right and you're wrong. Um, partner comes home from work expecting dinner to be served. And, uh, and they, maybe he said in the morning he wanted steak. And then when you serve dinner, you know, he could do things like throwing it on the floor and yelling and saying that you're too stupid to follow simple instructions. That would be, Really a bad, uh, a horrible example, but name calling, putting you down, uh, limiting your access to money, uh, reinforcing traditional gender roles from the past, turning your kids against you, pitting your kids, you know, buttering up kids, spoiling them, giving them whatever they want so that they'll like you more than the nice parent who gives them limits. Um, and uh, jealous accusations we mentioned. Um, Threatening your children or your pets; those are those are all types of things. And, and I've seen people, uh, I've seen women for therapy who have been in that kind of relationship, and, and where they were getting beat up and everything, and they finally get to a point where they're strong enough to make the break, and then they make the break, and they go to a shelter and and uh, and you know keep getting therapy and stuff. But then a month later, they go back to the abusive mate. Right. In lots of times. Uh, lots of times, Kristen, you can add add some stuff. I'm sure from all your experience about uh, in all the people you've worked with yourself or had discussions with in your interviews and all that. That why would somebody do that? You know, what are some right. reasons why somebody would go back? Sometimes it's because uh, I think the most common thing I've seen is if they grew up with a parent that beat them up all the time and beat up mom all the time, and then they get used to that. And unconsciously, they want to fix their family of origin. So it's right. not a conscious thing, but more of an unconscious thing. They want to fix the family of origin. They want the love of a 
father that they never got. And so they marry somebody like daddy thinking they can finally get love from somebody like daddy or they want to get vengeance on daddy. And so they look for ways to marry somebody like that to get you know, a little subtle but ways to get even. Um, uh, so, there, but, but, you know, have you thought of, are there other, yeah, there, I why mean, would I've, somebody do that? I've seen, you know, so many things I've experienced it myself. Um, and I've certainly had um, plenty of relatives um, that have been in very abusive situations and no, they were never hit, but they were isolated. They were, uh, their children were hit in front of them. Um, and what I, what I always found interesting, that's why I, I liken it to, you know, being with a cult leader, because this person takes up so much room, emotional room, um, in, a, you know, what they deem as intellectual room. Um, they're the smartest, they're the godlike figure of the house. Yeah. Or yeah, the, the world, yeah, you're, you're Ex- right. and they're yeah, they're far the spiritual from leader, it. you know. <laughs> yeah, oh yes, I mean, I I know someone who is a you know a former cop and a former you know in the army, a, det- a yeah. sergeant in the army, and also a reverend, and yet they yeah, had most pastors are nice guys, but there's some that are really awful, you know, narcissistic and controlling. Yep. Yeah. And and their spouse is so they have that spouse trained. If they tell that spouse to jump, now have they ever hit that spouse? No, but that spouse will read a resume. I mean, knows every medal of commendation they've ever received, and and you know that spouse will jump to defend them. They don't even have to defend themselves, and yet yeah. that spouse is, you know, th- their lights are out. They don't, they cannot think without, they think of what that person's reaction would be to everything that they do or say before they um, even have one of their own. And it takes um, so much work to get them to have a self again. Yeah, I saw a male patient today who is forcibly controlled uh, by a female and um, it's actually not a mate, but um, he. I asked him, you know, you know who, because he, he he's got some degree of social phobia and things, and and I asked him who, who are you? And he says, I don't know. He says, uh, I'm who, you know, when I'm around other people, I'm whoever they want to be. But I've never figured out who I am. Right. And, uh, uh, but you know, while he's here, he'll figure that out. You know, I just thought of something else, Kristen. A lot of people, especially wives, uh, if they marry an abusive uh, guy, um, and most, you know, course of control, whether he's physically abusive or not, um, they the guy earns a living, and she's automatically uh, designated as the housewife. You know, and not that there's right. anything wrong with being a housewife, but right. but. Um, and and uh, so she becomes financially dependent on them, and then they have it set up where, um, you know, if they if they're wealthy or something, they've got got it set up with good lawyers. Where if they do get a divorce, somehow the wife gets nothing and the man gets everything, and because uh, uh, they got great lawyers, and the wife can't afford a lawyer, and, right? Um, and so some women stay in. I've seen a lot of women that stay in abusive situations. I've got clients that I just love and adore that are just sweet women. And I ask them, why do you stay in that relationship? Because I'd be, uh, it's either that or be homeless. And, uh, right. And, so right. And I've seen it. Because they're living in a nice expensive home and they have, right. they do have friends. And I say, well, if you're going to stay there, at least have a life apart, totally apart from your husband, like where you're sharing a different part of the house and you develop, uh, friends and, and your own life, you know, that, you know, where he happens to be renting the, in the same house or something like that, you know, if you insist on staying with him. Go ahead, what were you going to say? I had a situation where um, the spouse was the one who had all the money, inherited money and so on, but they, they brought this, you know, they got married and the marriage was rushed and they married at, when they were in absolute grief over the death of their 
previous spouse and this, they, this person swooped in at a vulnerable moment, didn't have any money, no connections, nothing. The, the other spouse did, but they swoop in, took control, uh, isolated that person, um, drove a wedge between that person and their family, their friends. Yep. And then you looked at time. you looked at their past and you go, oh, well, they've done that to several other people as well. And uh, and they have all these quit claim deeds and all these homes that they've uh, that, where they've gone in and done the same thing found a, a grieving widow and uh, decided, oh, I'm going to get them to buy a house with me on it. And then I'm going to control them within an inch of their life and separate them from everything. And then I'm going to just uh, walk out and and I have them under so much control that I'm going to get them to go to a courthouse and give me half of everything and half of this house that I brought no money into uh, and have studied which states are more likely to allow this yep. kind of behavior. I mean, just absolutely. Right. And then you look at, you know, that this has been going on and on and on with multiple people, even within their own family. This is a life yeah. pattern for them. And they absolutely believe that, you know, it doesn't matter. I had a situation where uh, the the aggrieved spouse was um, told, finally said, that's it. I'm not taking this anymore. I'm the one that's financially set here. You're not going to, you know, they finally took a stand and, and started inviting people back in. And I, I always thought of this person as, you know, the world's most uh, ignorant yet savvy grifter, because as soon as they figured out that the jig was up, boy, they, you know, dropped the act of pretending to care about this person and just tried to siphon as much money and and goods yeah. and which I thought, well, they're they're driving off like the price is right. They've got a new RV, yeah. they've got a motorcycle, they've got two new cars, yeah. and now they get 50% of this house. Um, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I, I just look at that and go, how does this go on? And yet they never hit them. So it's not considered abuse in in some ways. And if they get a good attorney, an attorney can take someone who's already been traumatized for years and put them on the stand and traumatize them oh, further. Oh yeah. Oh, just ridicule them. And yeah, yes. the, the attorneys will just, just attack, you know, some, some attorneys will just attack the innocent person and, and uh, make them, you know, try to make them look stupid and, and, uh, and evil and all sorts of stuff. Um, and manipulate them to get angry and and, and then get this things. Paul this this speaks to all the times you've talked about narcissists and sociopaths I watched one I was there do, with a therapy dog doing a guardian ad litem um, support for someone who was in that situation and um, not only did the they this person didn't even bother they were so they had gone to law school but never taken the bar exam because it was beneath yeah. them but they had but they defended themselves and so they got to stand up there and be their own lawyer and abuse this person on the stand uh because you know they'd do it better than any attorney and that this is allowed yeah i i i know of a case uh where the the um, abusive um, husband divorced uh, the wife, and and uh, and they had a lot of money. Uh, but he, he had a really good attorney, and he had it set up where she had limited access to the funds, and uh, and so his attorney outwitted her attorney, and uh, and they they uh, pretty much gave her what she wanted, and she thought she had a good deal in the divorce, but. But in the language, he put, you know, the monthly payments of this for so many years uh, as uh, as desired or something like that, a little term right. there like that. And so he never, he never made a payment. And uh, right. when she went back to court, they said, well, no, it says as desired it means if he wants to. <laughs> <You know>? Right. <laughs> he didn't want exactly. to. Exactly. He didn't have to pay her anything. And he didn't. And uh, um, it's, it's uh I mean, there's there's really nice attorneys. Uh, attorneys like to tell psychiatry jokes, and psychiatrists <laughs> like to tell during attorney <laughs> jokes. I guess maybe I better not. I might offend some people if I tell a attorney joke, but uh, um, 
And, and I mean, some but, of them are great. I mean, I've, I've yeah, met some, some attorneys that exactly, but I've also met some attorneys where they know what's up. They know, I, I watched one do yeah. an interview with, with, a um, with a, with a spouse in this kind of a situation. And I was there to be support and, yeah. and the, uh, the attorney said, so basically you were this person's sugar mama. And, you know, and they got it like they got it and they had then they were so well thought of as an attorney um, in in the district that they were in, that they were able to push things through that were absolutely 100 percent legal, but that maybe another attorney would have um, either not cared or didn't know or whatever the reasons are. But, you know, there are the good ones out there that are fighting the good fight and making sure it. that people are, you know, being taken care of as they should be. Right. I've got a really, really great attorney I've had for many, many, for decades for all different kinds of things, business things and, and all, all sorts of different things. And he's always very kind and fair and wants to do what's right, even for the other person. And, uh, well, there's some great ones, just like there's, there's some great ones. Great exactly. And, and some sane ones. You know? <laughs> absolutely. And, you know, I've seen the situations where, um, let's say uh, there was one where this person was a former detective and they were the abusive one and they would sit and try to, they bring a camera uh, to where, and, and they were told by the victim's attorney, you have there, you are to have no contact you are to have no contact with this person and they would look for places or they would just show up unannounced and stand on that at that person's house before a protective order is in place. And they would get them on camera and say, now, didn't you do this and do that? And I watched the person go, well, no, that's not correct. And then they'd say, no, this is and the you know, the abuser is saying, no, this is what you said. Like, they're just telling them, this is what you said and filming the whole thing. And you don't, I'm not putting down detectives and they have a job to do it's, but there are as many of my friends, some of them podcasters on the net, on the network. One of them was an undercover narcotics officer for years. And all of them have told me, listen, I don't care if this person what fought in, you know, Iraq and are decorated and they were a detective. You don't bring that home with you and use it to control your family. Yeah. Not all cops do that. Not all veterans right. do these things or whoever. So, you know, you the they'll get the victim to go, oh, but they have all this trauma and that's why they behave this way and blah, 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 blah. And so I always look at that so narcissistic. It's so narcissistic. They don't even have to take responsibility for their abuse because they get their victims to do it for them. Yeah. And, and uh, as a psychiatrist, I, uh, I try to figure out, you know, whenever I do a workup of somebody for the first time, I, I ask them about their childhood and about their mate's childhood too. And right. if they're married to a narcissist or a sociopath that's uh, coercively controlling them, then then uh, I try to figure out what made him or her decide to be that way. And uh, exactly. the, most common thing, the most common thing I see is if, uh, if that person was spoiled growing up and had one pair, like uh, a recent case where the husband, the, the mom just spoiled the kid, the boy rotten and favored boys over girls and, and, uh, and gave him everything he wanted and told him he could do no wrong. And, and if the dad tried to discipline him, you know, she'd stand up to the dad. And, and so he learned growing up that that's what he deserved. He deserved everything. Right. And, uh, and some people become abusive because they were abused themselves. So some, uh, some got beat up a lot growing up and, and, and they have so much anger inside of them that they end up uh, abusing other people. So that's some of them. But, uh, and some people, I guess they could have really nice parents and just, um, over the years for various reasons of who they hung out with or two different experiences or, or whatever could become more and more sociopathic or. Absolutely. And you can have it in the same family. I mean, I've seen where that's a, you know, there's three siblings and 
Um, and two of them are the go the direction of, and they came from horribly abusive homes um, where there was coercive control and physical violence and so on t- to everyone, including the kids. And two of them grow up to be these incredible, loving, empathetic do-gooders. And then the one turns it was a victim, and then they became a predator themselves. Yeah, I, I was a, a guest on Oprah Winfrey years ago. And uh, where that's exactly what we discussed. Uh, I was a psychiatric expert, supposedly there. And uh, but <laughs> there was a family that where they had like three kids and two of them turned out just awesome. And one out to turn out to be a total sociopath. And, and, uh, and we were trying to analyze why that one child turned out different. And, and they were treated uh, the same by the parents, but they got that they hung out with and, and uh, various other circumstances. Um, made the one child go the opposite way. One, one other thing I want to mention, there's there's one other nice type of person that ends up being coercively controlling once in a while, and that's the explosive personality, believe it or not. Explosive personalities are different than sociopaths. Sociopaths are jerky all the time. You know, you know they yell and call you names and thought you and ridicule you and... Uh, make you question your own sanity and invade your privacy and punish you for not doing what they want. They're just jerks all the time. But some people are really nice guys or gals. You, it, it, let's use, it's most cases. It's a, it's a guy, but uh, that I've seen at least in my practice, but I've seen guys that were really nice guys and mates. Uh, so too, they, they were kind uh, to the kids and kind to the wife. And then maybe once every three months or six months, some little thing will happen and they explode and yell and, and they they hardly ever hit the mate, but they might grab her and scare her, or you know hold her against a, a wall temporarily or something, and just scares the living daylights out of her. Like, who is this guy? You know, is he really a jerk who's pretending to be nice all the rest of the time? And uh, in almost every case, when that and then and then the explosive personality is very sorry and repentant and cries even and apologizes uh, afterwards and says, I don't know why I did that. And in almost every case uh, that I've seen, the explosive male was one that got sexually abused, uh, usually by another male when he, mm. when he was young. And it's a I'm deep not sure shame. why it happens that way, but but he got control. He got coercively controlled by somebody that abused him. Right. And uh, and and he's so angry about. It. And usually they haven't told anybody. They haven't had therapy to deal with it. And so they got that repressed anger. And so uh, if some little thing happens that might bring a flashback about feeling controlled by that abusive mate. They don't, by that abusive uh, male, older male, they don't remember. They won't even think about that happening. They won't remember it happening, but unconsciously they explode and don't know why, but when they get therapy and deal with the past uh, sexual abuse, then they get nice. Nobody's nice all the time, but they get nice almost all the time and they don't get explosive anymore. And uh, so that there's one type a personality that gets sometimes coercively controlling, but for like maybe an hour or, or so, but then it's a rare incident. But, um, but people, that, How about- the ones, the ones that if you're starting a relationship with somebody and, uh, and they yell at you and they call you names and they insult you or ridicule you for not agreeing with them or make you question your sanity, invade your privacy uh, push you for not doing what they want, try to control your life, isolate you from family and friends. We brought that one up several times, uh, make subtle threats. Um, that's somebody to get away from, you know, and, uh, stay away from. Absolutely. And most people, most of, most of you who are listening to us right now, if you started to date somebody like that, they'd be gone in a minute, you know, right. you'd, you'd break up with that person right away. But some of you are really nice people. But you'd keep putting up with it and putting up with it. And usually if, if you keep putting up with it, it means you had a parent that was that way and you got used to it and maybe even feel like you deserve it. And so that's where therapy into understanding your childhood is, is so helpful. Go ahead. What Absolutely. Gonna... Well, I, I've talked about this on shows and I think it's a good thing to bring up here. Um, you know, when you are living in that kind of abuse when you are being coercively controlled uh, over any length of time, but especially over, you know, years, 
um, I call it getting flea and tick syndrome. You are going to have bad behaviors and develop quote unquote bad behaviors of your own in order to survive this relationship. And it does take some time to with therapy and with having friends and family back in your life again and reiterating, no, that's, um, that is not what happened. They were abusive or, or whatever. It, it's going to take some time for you to let that, you know, get out of your system. And you find, I mean, all of my friends that have been in these relationships that, um, get out of them, they find, almost in some cases the next day that they're the the fur the more that they have no contact with this person the more they see behaviors um of their own that just don't exist anymore because they don't need to exist anymore because they're not under the influence of that person yeah yeah they learn how to be a to defend themselves to some extent and the, how they don't need to go around fighting that are nice around <laughs> exactly <laughs> take advantage of them i've seen this yeah, too you paranoid you can get paranoid if absolutely abusing you, you you know if, if you're living under years of abuse then you're going to be more likely to think that that all men are alike or right uh, that you know um that abuse is inevitable and um oh i see that a lot you know women that have been sexually abused by by more than one man in particular um or men that have been abused by more than one woman where they assume it's inevitable so when it does happen another abuse situation happens they just sort of they numb out and just take it yep. just take it the fighting and I, exactly and i i've i've watched situations and i had this happen within my own family where um, you know, an uncle was absolutely trying to convince all of us that his wife, my aunt, was crazy and shouldn't be allowed to drive and shouldn't touch the money and all these things. And every time we would come over, um, he would do something uh, that he did. Like, I'll give you an example. Um, he had these crazed dogs, very big dogs that were constantly getting in dog fights with the smaller other dogs. And that was a way of controlling my aunt as well was by having these dogs, but he would blame this behavior on her. And so at one time she opened her front door because he came home and the dogs were just going wild to go see him. And they, his dogs ran out and jumped on his new car and scratched it. And he went crazy yelling and screaming about how she was going to pay for that. It was her fault because she let the dogs out and you know just yeah. constant situations like that where we would all stand there as kids and go but you're the one and and he would try to bring us in on the you know your aunt she's so stupid she shouldn't be allowed to drive when every car accident that had ever happened in that family were when he was driving the car but he would try to reel us into agreement with him that this is what was going on and you know it, it became it was weird to go over there and watch this and, and to have him like, you know, jab you in the ribs, like, come on, you know, she's stupid da, 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 when you know. So that's not just them coercively controlling their mate, but they're trying to do it with, you know, the kids as, as well. Yeah. Yeah. What, what, uh, what effect does uh, growing up where one parent coercively abuses the other parent chronically, what effect does that have on kids, Kristen? Oh my gosh, it makes you question reality constantly um, and live with paranoia and fear. And also it puts you in a position to be, have someone be able to come into your own life because, you know, you've said the, you've given on many shows about, you know, the ages that are the most, where we as kids absorb the most information that dead, that um, dictates how we're going to live in our lives. Well, you watch that as a young kid and then all of a sudden that behavior becomes acceptable and so you are in grave danger of having this kind of a person come into your life and abuse you yeah and some people might be surprised but 50 percent of your uh, according to research about 50 percent of your adult personality is formed by your third birthday and 85 mm-hmm. percent by your sixth birthday now that doesn't mean you're locked into it you know thank god 
uh, with his help and the help of a good therapist and, uh, and, a, and a kind friend or two, uh, right. you can change no matter how old you are. But most people don't bother getting insight or getting therapy. They just pretty much stay in whatever they learned the first six years. And so, like, if there's an abusive mate, then uh, I think it affects the men and women a little differently, too, because the, the, the male children might uh, be more prone to be, if it's a male abuser, the male children might be more likely to become male abusers themselves. And the female uh, females getting abused might be more likely to uh, unconsciously look for uh, males that will abuse them to continue what they got used to in childhood. Uh, but it could be, you know, it, it could be either way. Children right, people who are right. abused do not grow up to abuse others. In fact, most of them are super nice. I mean, that, some of my nicest patients that I have are, are patients that were abused in childhood and they become super nice in, in uh, uh, somehow as a reaction to, to that. I guess they become so humble. Uh, but uh, research shows that um, kids who are physically abused and, and coercively abused growing up are slightly more likely to engage in toxic behaviors, somewhat more likely to. But, right. uh, but a lot of them, you know, most of them don't. But uh, they're more likely to develop eating disorders, headaches, uh, heart disease later, mental health issues. Binge eating, alcohol uh, abuse. abuse. Yeah. Yeah. Alcohol abuse to numb it out. Post-traumatic stress disorder, um, including angry outbursts, uh, being easily startled. Yeah. Oh, my thoughts, gosh. That startle response. Trauma, yes. Yeah, nightmares. Reliving the trauma, experiencing physical symptoms such as rapid heartbeat. I like to ask you and I have done a number of shows on dreams, but I ask my patients their dreams often, you know, and uh, because uh, if they have a recurrent nightmare um, about being chased, you know, and things like that, then I ask them more about their childhood. And less times it was because there was a uh, an abusive uh, parent that they were scared of all the time. Yeah, absolutely. And um, coming out of it, I mean, I want to stress that there's so many people out there that um, that wonder, because I've just been speaking with a grief counselor who's um, doing a show on the network, and um, we're going to do a series on widows who have been in a wonderful marriage, loving amazing. Uh, they're financially set. They, they, this mate felt like, you know, their soulmate and then they die unexpectedly. And they are, there are people out there that look for that person in their deep grief. And yes. maybe they've never been abused their entire life where they were in a, yeah. as a child or what have you. And then now all of the sudden in their later years, which this is considered elder abuse, but then they become in this abusive situation. And so not only are they trying to, you know, get out of it and hopefully without being completely financially destroyed, but then they have right. the societal shame of how could you do this? Wouldn't, don't you know better? You're 70 something years old. You know, there's all of yeah. that on top of it as well. Yep. And they, you know, if somebody acts like they fell in love with them Absolutely. Oh, you know, here's a relief from pain I suffered by losing my nice husband. Exactly. And and here's and thank you for giving me your credit card. And now I'm gonna Yeah, you know. (laughs) And that's another thing. Somebody that we were talking about parent people that grew up with an abusive mate and all that sort of thing. If you grew up with super nice parents and, and, and if you were married to a really super nice mate and your mate dies. Some, lots of times, because you're so nice, and the people around you were so nice, you assume everybody's nice. Exactly. And sometimes it's easier for you to get taken by uh, a, a sociopathic uh, control freak um, because you believe they're nice. And so when occasionally a little bit of this other stuff slips out, you know, you may be surprised, but then they, you know, then they quickly cover it up until they get married to you and take advantage of you but and so because you think people are so nice like my parents were really nice and i think i'm a nice guy and 
man, did I get, when I became a doctor, and, and we grew up, you know, on the poor side of the half of the, you know, of the fence. And, uh, my dad was a carpenter and stuff. We weren't poor, but we were middle class and maybe a little bit, you know, on, on the 48th percentile of that. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> uh, when I became a doctor and, uh, uh, of course I didn't, I took a low paying job even when I became a doctor, um, teaching at a seminary for 12,600 a year. But I, I wrote books that sold a million copies each in the first few. And so when money started coming in, then, uh, then, uh, it was easier because I was a nice guy. My parents were nice to get ripped off. Right. When people came along and even friends would come along and say, Hey, I got this great deal for you. I think, Oh, wonderful. And then the great deal, here's was a check getting everything and me getting nothing. <laughs> right. Right. I've and, seen that uh, happen so, with, with some relatives so too. To get, where they, yeah. Yeah. So they come into some money a, and then all of a sudden yeah. they, they've got predators lurking around going on the, they are telling you, yeah. Oh, I love you so much and I'll take care of you and instilling the fear of everything, including God in you. And, you know, and then, and you open up your pocketbook to help this poor traumatized yeah. individual that this is why they behave right. this way because you're such a nice person that you, you're right. You don't have that experience to know any different. So let's close this out with, you know, what can people do when they notice this going on with someone else? And also if they notice that it's going on within themselves, within their own life, that they are the ones being controlled. What are some first steps that okay. you as a bystander and you as the person having it happen to you can do? Okay, I've got some right here that I gathered from research before we did this program. So, uh, so part of it's my experience with patients, but part of it's from this too. Reasoning with an abuser is tempting, but unlikely to work. So don't try to reason with the abuser. Even in the Bible, in Proverbs chapter 9, it says, if you rebuke a wise man, he'll love you for it. But if you rebuke a fool, he'll hate you for it. So don't waste your time trying to persuade a fool. Uh, Chris and I have been doing this for years, and we're good friends. And I think we're both really nice people. And if, uh, if I do something offensive and Kristen points it out, she would do it in a loving way. Right. And, uh, and, and I would thank her for it. I'd be, you know, like if I stick my foot in my mouth, which I often do <laughs> on a Same radio here. program, she'll say, Paul, you know, here, 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 there, here might be a better way to word that sometime. And, <laughs> and I appreciate it. So, uh, don't try to reason with an abuser. Another one, uh, set boundaries, Refuse to engage in unreasonable arguments. Uh, uh, you, you get so used to trying to win an argument with somebody that's manipulating you that it's better just to walk away from the argument. And, uh, you know, if you're married to a narcissist, then you feel like you have to walk on eggshells, uh, but don't walk on eggshells. And if they leave you, they leave you. If they leave you, it's a blessing. Absolutely. You know? <laughs> so don't oh, walk on eggshells. Speak the truth. The Bible says, speak the truth in love, be polite, but uh, uh, just don't try to argue. Say, here's what, you know, here's what I feel, and I'm not going to argue about that. You know, let's agree to disagree, and you walk off. And uh, if they, you know, get violent or something, get, get the heck out of there. Limit your exposure to the abuser as much as possible. That's what I've said to people that just say, well, i got to live with this guy because uh, he's got all the money, and I don't want to be poverty-stricken. And I say, well, if that's your choice, and if you do that, then at least live in a separate part of the house, develop your own friends, spend as little time, you know, seeing them as possible. And, uh, and, um, then when you are ready, you need to cut all the ties. If you can, you like, right. uh, if you go, if you go through a divorce, um, from a abusive mate, if you have a good lawyer, he'll even help get injunctions and things. He'll say, Protective don't orders. ever talk to the mate. Uh, right. Even about the kids, have somebody else have it go through somebody else. Don't ever talk to the mate. Uh, have, if he wants to tell you something, let him tell his lawyer to tell me, and I'll tell That's you. That's right. And uh, and and uh, and so don't have any contact because you've been manipulated so many years that it would be easy for you to fall into it again, or he could trick you, uh, or she could. You know, I want to make sure we point that. that like on the MMPI, it's been given to millions and millions of people, psychological tests, and men, men and women come out equally sociopathic. It's not one right. or the other. Men tend to be more violent because they're, you know, they're bigger and stuff in our culture and things. But uh, there's, there's uh, women who are um, controllers, too, but do it in a, in a more subtle way. 
And so I don't want to, again, I don't want to be a um, male chauvinist pig myself. I mean, I don't want to be an anti-male chauvinist pig. Because you know? <laughs> <laughs> I, right. I, I, I'm so used to saying it myself. Well, if the man's doing this, the woman needs to do that. And so I get used to saying that too, but I need to point out that it can be both ways. Absolutely. And counseling, 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 because you need to have someone that will sit and hear exactly how how your brain responds to things, what your responses are. And a a trained therapist will know when you are um, answering as a a trauma response to and, and how you've been programmed to respond and knows how to guide you out of that, which takes time. It's not something, and that is why no contact is so important. Um, you can tell a way for you to tell if you, if you're with someone who's an abuser, even if you have all the evidence in front of you, but you know, you've been trained to ignore these things. Well, guess what? If you get an attorney and the attorney says no contact and that person refuses to speak through an attorney, they come over to your house and they, and they try to corner you and, and speak to you when they've been told you are to contact the attorney, not directly yeah, my client. If injunction. they can't do that, that is yeah. an abuse, period. No question. Yep. You'll be arrested. No nothing. Hundred, exactly. Yeah, you'll be arrested. Exactly. Yeah. 100% another thing, abuse. Another thing is to develop friends as soon as you can. Because right. uh, if you've been isolated, uh, get into a... Uh, you know, a church, a whatever, a church is. group or, or a card group or some group of other uh, women or, or couples or, you know, but uh, get in a group of, of healthy people. Uh, there's a lot of uh, churches and, and cathedrals and things that have uh, celebrate recovery are free, free health groups that are run uh, quite well. And we encourage uh, if people can't afford regular group therapy, or even if they can, it's a, it's a, those are good. They're all over the country. Uh, and there's uh, organizations that help. There's one here in North Carolina called Reach um, that that will help you. Uh, there are hotlines to call. You can Google domestic violence hotline. Reach out. These people are trained. They know exactly what they're dealing with when you are calling. And sometimes that is the first person that will say things that help your your brain create healthier neural pathways so that you start thinking outside of the control of that person. Um, that's get, what those places are there for. Let me give you that telephone number, okay? Uh, that that Christian just mentioned. It's the National Domestic Abuse Hotline. So if you have a pen handy, National Domestic Abuse Hotline, it's 800-799-7233. And they're open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. 1-800-799-7233. That's the National Domestic Abuse Hotline. So if you're in an abusive relationship and you want to, start, you know, figuring out ways to make the, make the break, like we've been sharing with you, then call that number and they'll help get you started. They've got so much experience with it. Advocates that will go to court with you, uh, that will help you fill out paperwork for uh, 50B or 50C protective orders. I mean, these these people help you every step of of the way. And sometimes that is, that is your absolutely free of charge. So, and people like me will show up in court with a therapy dog to help you through, you know, situations like that as well. And don't think that just because Paul and I are talking about this, that we haven't experienced different kinds of situations like this in our own lives that we've needed to go to therapy for. So that shame that we all carry about, oh, it's happened to us. Now I should be ashamed. And there are shallow people everywhere that are going to judge you just like they judge everybody. I'm so glad that they, that their entire life is filled with no drama, no pain, no whatever. How did you ever get here as a human being? If, if that's what your life experience is going to be, but there are people that will (laughs) convince you of that and you just have to just kind of, okay, I don't need to talk to those people because they're coming from places of superiority and judgment. I'm going to go talk to these people at this domestic violence organization and realize that just about everybody has experienced some form of trauma or abuse of some kind at some point in their life. Exactly. We haven't even mentioned at work, you know, some 
a lot of people nowadays are in abusive situations at work, you know, especially. Absolutely. Oh, that's a whole other. Doing the job Absolutely. with three people and just going nuts. Exactly. Well, Paul, I'm so glad that we can come back together and talk about this important topic. And yeah. um, and listeners, if you have questions or concerns or you want to explain a situation, please email us. You can email us at info at mhnrnetwork.com and um, ask whatever questions you'd like. And Paul and I can come back on and do a show and you know, no names will be used, but we can, you know, we can even change things around male to female or whatever is needed to make sure that it's answered and discussed in a safe way. Um, please feel free to do that. And again, Paul, thank you. I'm so glad you could do this. And listeners, thank you for yeah. tuning in. We'll do this again in a few weeks. Absolutely. We hope you enjoyed this podcast. Tune in next time for another engaging discussion on relevant mental health topics. If you have any questions about Meyer Clinics, please visit our website at meyerclinics.com. That's M-E-I-E-R clinics.com or call us at 888-7-CLINIC. Don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or any of your favorite podcast apps. And please note that we are a member of and produced by Mental Health News Radio Network, mhnrnetwork.com.